Please note that in the YouTube description, we have links to Discord, Patreon, and the sources that I referenced to be able to make this video. Yvarice Galois was a 19th century French mathematician and political activist. He died in a duel at the age of 20, and in his short life, made fundamental contributions to abstract algebra, laying the early foundations of group theory. Galois was born on October 25, 1811, in Bourg-la-Reine, Paris. His parents were Nicolas Gabriel Galois, a liberal and supporter of Napoleon Bonaparte who became mayor of Bourg-la-Reine in 1815, following Napoleon's first return from exile, and Adelaide Marie Dumont, the daughter of a jurist. Galois had two siblings, an older sister named Natalie Theodore, who lived from 1808 to 1881, and a younger brother named Alfred, who lived from 1814 to 1849. Galois was educated by his mother for the first 12 years of his life. She was well-versed in language, the classics, and religion, relaying this knowledge to her son. She gave Galois a solid foundation in Greek and Latin, and instilled her strong skepticism for organized religion. Other than some exposure to arithmetic, it's unlikely Galois' mother taught him more mathematics than that, as it wasn't considered very important at the time. In October of 1823, Galois began attending the Royal College of Louis Le Grand, and immediately began developing his potent political views, his liberal views being saturated by his parents and the students around him. During Galois' first term, students staged minor rebellions due to their belief that the newly appointed headmaster was trying to turn the school toward Jesuit teaching, instead of staying liberal. The students held minor rebellions to show their distaste in this, which included refusing to recite anything asked of them in class, and refusing to toast King Louis XVIII at a school banquet. The headmaster ended up expelling 40 students he suspected of leading the rebellion, of which Galois was not included. And it's not known whether he actually participated, but it's suspected the headmaster's expulsion contributed to Galois' distrust and authority. Galois did relatively well academically his first few years at Louis Le Grand. He had won several prizes in Greek and Latin, as well as getting several honorable mentions. However, at age 15, Galois had to repeat his third year at Louis Le Grand due to failing his rhetoric class. As fate would have it, this repeat year resulted in Galois enrolling in his first mathematics course, led by Hippolyte Jean Vernier, a 19th century French mathematician and physicist, most notable for being Galois' first ever mathematics lecturer. Galois was beside himself with curiosity immediately drawn to what Vernier had exposed him to. Galois began eating up mathematics, inhaling Legendre's work on geometry, as well as Lagrange's analysis memoirs, where Galois was first exposed to the theory of equations. Galois began almost solely focusing on mathematics. This resulted in him neglecting his other coursework, which angered his humanities teachers. Vernier, though keen on Galois' mathematical fascination, tried to persuade Galois to balance out his focus, but this advice was ignored. With how passionate Galois had become, he attempted to get into a Cole Polytechnique a year early by taking the entrance exam. Having no proper prep courses in mathematics, and apparently lacking some of the basics, Galois failed the exam. Despite this blow, he continued to ingest mathematics rapidly, and enrolled in the most advanced course Louis Le Grand offered, taught by Louis-Paul Emile Richard a 19th century French mathematician, most notable for teaching Galois. Richard immediately noticed Galois' mathematical talent, advocating for Galois to be accepted to École Polytechnique without taking the entrance exam. This ultimately didn't pan out, but was great motivation for Galois. In March of 1829, still in high school, Galois published his first paper in the Annals of Pure and Applied Mathematics, titled Proof of a Theorem on Periodic Continued Fractions. The paper proved that the continued fraction of a quadratic irrational alpha is purely periodic if and only if alpha is greater than 1, and the conjugate of alpha is strictly between negative 1 and 0. Though still relatively new to mathematics, Galois began trying to tackle the difficult problem of determining whether an algebraic equation can be solved by radicals. It had already been proven by Niels Abel that a general polynomial of degree greater than or equal to 5 cannot be solved by radicals, but the question that still remained open for over 300 years at that point regarded the conditions determining solvability by radicals. The solution Galois came up with contained the early foundations for group theory and kicked off what would become known as Galois theory later on. Galois submitted his group theoretic work to the French Academy of Sciences toward the end of May 1829. Alas, the submittal was not presented to the Academy. 
Though the work was rough and did require revision, it seems this non-presentation was due to a hiccup. The way the story goes is that Augustin Louis Cauchy, who'd previously explored permutation theory and later wrote extensively on group theory himself, was assigned to the paper and intended on giving a full hearing to the results, but couldn't come in the day it was to be presented. Cauchy rescheduled for the following week, but ended up just discussing results from his own work, and never actually followed through afterwards with presenting Galois' work. René Taton, a 20th century French author and science historian, speculates that Cauchy had actually advised Galois to expand the work and submit to the Academy's grand prize, which Galois did in February of 1830. In July of 1829, about a month after Galois's group theoretic submittal, his father was framed by a Jesuit priest. The priest forged his name into malicious epigrams that were then sent to Galois's direct relatives, which resulted in Galois's father hanging himself in his own Paris apartment, unable to bear the shame this Jesuit priest had brought upon him. A few weeks after this incident, Galois committed to retaking the Polytechnique entrance exam and failed yet again. Between his father's death and this result, Galois' already intense hatred for the conservative ruling in France was further strengthened, pinning his problems on their rule in a conspiratorial fashion. In November of 1829, still wanting to attend university, Galois took the entrance exam to get into École Normale. He passed, largely due to his fantastic score in the mathematics section. In February of 1830, Galois resubmitted his group theoretic work to the Academy, titled On the Conditions of the Solubility of Equations by Radicals. It landed on Joseph Fourier's desk at the time, but Fourier died in May of 1830, assumably before he'd even gotten to looking at Galois' work. Strangely, Galois' manuscript was never even found among Fourier's papers, so it wasn't even considered for the grand prize. This incident only fueled Galois' conspiratorial thinking. He felt the series of rejections he'd been experiencing was political, that his affiliation with the late mayor was the cause of all of this. In an attempt to get his work out there, Galois began publishing in a journal called the Bulletin of Mathematical Sciences, publishing a total of three papers in it, on group theory, differential equations, and number theory. In July of 1830, a revolution took place that resulted in Charles X, who'd been the King of France since September 1824, being exiled. Republicans took power for a short time until Louis-Philippe took the crown. Galois and his fellow students at École Normale wanted to hit the streets and engage in the fighting that was taking place, but the school director locked them in the school. Galois tried scaling the walls, but it was to no avail. After this, Galois took a break from Normal and proceeded to become more radical over the next few months. He joined Republican societies, meeting with Republican leaders, and most likely participated in the many demonstrations and riots that were happening in Paris. Galois also joined the artillery of the National Guard, which was a militia made up almost solely of Republicans. In December of 1830, Galois wrote a letter accusing the director of École Normale of being a traitor to his country, per the events of the July Revolution. Galois apparently wrote this as a response to the director writing a nasty article in the School Gazette, which attacked the students of Normal. The Gazette's director omitted Galois' name, but the school director knew it was Galois and promptly expelled him. After his expulsion, Galois went to live with his mother, and it's claimed he was so difficult to live with that his mother fled the home not long after. It was clear that Galois was in a rather terrible mental space, drowning in toxicity. A fine example of this was Galois attending meetings at the Academy of Sciences and habitually insulting speakers, per Sophie Germain, a 17th and 18th century French mathematician and physicist, notable for being one of the pioneers of elasticity theory. Germain further expressed that Galois was broken and worried for his sanity. Despite Galois' plummeting mental state, he was still quite productive, and by January of 1831, he had a more complete version of his group theoretic work. He resubmitted this to the Academy at the request of Simeon Denis Poisson, a 19th century French mathematician and physicist notable for his work across many fields, including statistics, partial differential equations, and electricity and magnetism. Poisson had great trouble deciphering what Galois was trying to convey, leading to him rejecting the work and encouraging Galois to revise and submit again. He also criticized one of Galois' proofs, a statement that was easily proven by a result of Lagrange. Galois wouldn't see any of this critique until much later in the year. On May 9, 1831, Galois attended a Republican banquet in which Republicans celebrated the acquittal of 19 artillery officers that had been accused of plotting a coup. Galois at some point in the evening got up from a seat and proposed a toast with both his glass and his dagger, saying, To Louis-Philippe. There was uproarious cheer to this toast amongst the Republicans, but this act was taken as a threat, and Galois was arrested the next day for it. He was held in Saint-Pelagie prison for a month. At his trial, 
The defense claimed that Galois actually said to Louis Philippe if he betrays, but that the massive cheering drowned out the final part of Galois's statement. This defense proved successful, as Galois was acquitted just a few minutes after. On July 14th, 1831, Galois was arrested again and was not so lucky this time. He was arrested for wearing the disbanded artillery guard gear, gear that was now illegal, as well as being heavily armed with daggers and guns. This act, seen as one of defiance, resulted in Galois being imprisoned in saint pelagie for eight months. Galois was not happy about this. He was overtaken by rage and ultimately a loss of hope. To add insult to injury, it was in prison that Galois finally received his third rejection from the academy, from Poisson. It should be no surprise that Galois prefaced a memoir with the following. I tell no one that I owe anything of value in my work to his advice or encouragement. I do not say so because it would be a lie. I owe to important men the fact that the first of these papers is appearing so late. I owe to other important men that the whole thing was written in prison. Galois' mental state became so poor during this time that he apparently tried to end his own life with a dagger, but his prison mates stopped him before he could do anything. In March of 1832, there was a cholera outbreak plaguing Paris, resulting in Galois being transferred to a nursing home in Sieur Faltrier. Galois met a girl there named Stephanie Felicie Poteron du Motel, the daughter of a resident physician at the nursing home. Galois became enamored, though their affair was quite brief. On April 29, 1832, Galois was officially released from prison. He continued to exchange letters with Stephanie, but it was clear from their correspondence that she was trying to distance herself from their affair. On May 25, 1832, Galois wrote a rather angsty letter to his friend Auguste Chevalier of the heartbreak he felt over Stephanie. How can I console myself when in one month I have exhausted the greatest source of happiness a man can have, when I have exhausted it without happiness, without hope, when I am certain it is drained for life? On May 30th, 1832, Galois partook in a duel and was left for dead after being shot in the abdomen. He was found by a farmer and was taken to Cochon Hospital, dying the next day. On his deathbed, Galois apparently said to his brother, Don't cry, Alfred. I need all my courage to die at 20. There has been a lot of speculation and much romanticizing as to why the duel took place, such as a fight with another man for Stephanie or political reasons, which his brother Alfred firmly believed. Alfred seems to have not been alone in this, as Galois' funeral on June 2nd ended in riots. There were plans of a full-blown uprising during Galois' funeral that ended up being postponed until June 5th, due to General Jean-Maximilien Lamarck having died on June 1st. Speculation aside, Galois was certain he was going to lose the duel, and wrote a letter for Chevalier expressing his death was imminent and attaching three mathematical manuscripts, requesting Chevalier help get his work out to the appropriate parties after his passing. The first two manuscripts contained his group theoretic work that had been rejected repeatedly by the Academy of Sciences. His third paper was never found, but it's known that it concerned integrals of general algebraic functions, per the letter to Chevalier. Let's talk briefly about Galois' group theoretic work. We'll reference Tony Rothman's The Short Life of Ivarice Galois to do so. Galois introduced three critical concepts whose relations allowed him to determine conditions of solvability for polynomials of degree greater than or equal to five. The first concept introduced is that of a Galois group, which is a powerful way of representing the symmetry properties of an equation. The larger the order of the Galois group, the more permutations there are for which the roots are indistinguishable. From this concept, Galois needed to show there are invariably equations of degree n, whose Galois group is the largest possible group of permutations of degree n. The second concept introduced is that of a normal subgroup of a group G. If a finite group has normal subgroups, there must exist a subgroup whose order is the largest of all the normal subgroups of G, coined the maximal normal subgroup of G. Since a maximal normal subgroup can have its own maximal normal subgroup, any group G generates a sequence of maximal normal subgroups and yields maximal normal composition factors from said sequence. The third concept introduced is that of a solvable group. If every one of the maximal normal composition factors generated by G is a prime number, the group is called solvable. From this breakdown, Galois was able to show an equation is solvable by radicals if, and only if, the Galois group of an equation is a solvable group. Galois chose the contrapositive route. It turns out that the nth symmetric group, S of n, is not a solvable group when n is greater than or equal to 5. 
For such values of n, there exist equations of degree n for which s of n is the Galois group, which implies there exists no solvable general equation for such values. Per Galois' request in his final letter to Chevalier, Alfred Galois and Chevalier copied Galois' chicken scratch into legible papers and sent them off to Gauss, Jacobi, and others. Alas, there's no recorded comments from any of these men, so it's not clear whether these folks even took a look. There seems to have been silence until 1846, where Joseph Liouville, a 19th century French mathematician and engineer, most notable for his contributions to complex analysis and mathematical physics, got his hands on Galois' group theoretic manuscripts and published them in the Journal of Pure and Applied Mathematics. Alas, not much came from this, as most people still found the results to be too obscure. In 1870, Camille Jordan, a 19th century French mathematician, notable for his foundational contributions to group theory, published a text titled On Substitutions and Algebraic Equations, which seemed to be written well enough to get more people on board with Galois' work, boosting Galois' theory. Galois' theory finally gained the form we know today in the early 1940s, per Emile Artin, after years of developments from various mathematicians. Artin rounded up the subject matter in lectures he gave in 1942 and 1944 at the University of Notre Dame. Well, there you have it. Another brief history of a fascinating mathematician. I'll end on a quote from Galois himself, from his first group theoretic manuscript. Since the beginning of the century, computational procedures have become so complicated that any progress by those means has become impossible, without the elegance which modern mathematicians have brought to bear on their research and by means of which the spirit comprehends quickly and in one step a great many computations. It is clear that elegance, so vaunted and so aptly named, can have no other purpose. Go to the roots of these calculations. Group the operations. Classify them according to their complexities rather than their appearances. This, I believe, is the mission of future mathematicians. If you enjoyed the video, please click that like button and subscribe. And if you generally just enjoy the content of this channel, please consider supporting on Patreon. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.